um, Stephen has thought to just check out Australia again for a few months, and he's been here since about three months almost, yeah, and is uh, due to stay for another month or so. And um, so I invited him, as he is here, to tell us a little bit about what he is doing, and also in relation to art here in Australia and what he's doing over there in Tuscany. Mm -hmm. uh, it is quite uh, uh, incredible yes. that uh, a lot of artists mm -hmm. who actually live here live in two different countries. There's two hearts there. So mm -hmm. it's the same with our artists, you know, or, or us as well, who mm -hmm. come from a different country. So we, we are living in two different places and trying to connect the two. And, and usually, or usually wherever we come from, it's actually quite opposite and quite different, even though it's all the West. But uh, it is very, very different, and the art scene is, of course, also very different to the European, not just the European, but particularly the Italian art scene. Uh, I don't think a lot of people really know much about the Italian art scene. Mm -hmm. So please enlighten us a little bit about it. <laughs> please, if you have any questions that um, that are burning questions for you to know about this, these two different sides of, you know, looking at life and leading a life in, in two different places in your heart. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have questions in this regard, please point them so it makes it very lively. And in the meantime, I will be serving you all uh, this morning French breakfast. And as uh, perhaps some of you may not know, but in France you eat the croissant on a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. Did you know that? But it's butcher paper. But I got the nice green idea. <laughs> So these are placements, um, and so you eat on those placements, just for those who don't know. Um, well, as Connie said, I haven't lived in Australia for a long, long time. I came back uh, for several months this time because I haven't been here for such a long time that I wanted to kind of reconnect and find something about myself, and uh, that's why I've been here. Uh, basically, being here, I discovered how much I love living in Italy, and so I'm very happy to go back to Italy. Uh, I love being in Australia too, but it's sort of now been, I've spent much more of my life out of Australia than in Australia. Um, from Australia, I went and I lived in Japan, and then from Japan, um, I went to Europe and ended up in Italy just by chance, and so we have lived in Italy ever since. Um, the first few years in Italy, I lived in Milan, and then for the last uh, 32 years, I've been in Tuscany. Um, the work I've done, um, I started doing photography in Australia. Uh, for many years, I lived with um, a painter, and when we separated, and we've sort of been doing things together, when we separated, um, I moved over, and for quite a few years, was doing a lot of painting, collage, and things like that. And then slowly, um, through an exhibition I did, I was asked to do near Naples, um, I've moved back into photography, um, basically because with, from the mid-90s on, that you could do large-scale color photography, which has a certain kind of weight. And when I say weight, I mean weight like, the way painting has weight to it, kind of like a metaphysical or emotional weight. Uh, that you can do in photography now. And so, since then, I've basically left painting and, and that and moved completely back into photography. The exhibition I've got here is, um, I mean, this exhibition wasn't planned. I didn't come to Australia to, to do it, but as I was here, Connie, and there's this amazing space that she has, she said, well, why don't we do an exhibition? Um, so, what it was, was pieces of, I've just been in Japan before coming, I had some work left over from the exhibition I'd done in Japan, so there was that. And there were a few different things from bodies of different work that, um, where I'd exhibited them in different places. So I sort of rearranged in a way that the exhibition could have some kind of um, structure to it, or where the different works would relate to each other. But basically they come from a series of different bodies of work of mine over the last 10 or 12 years. Um, another thing is there are individual images on the wall here that are parts of larger series which explains these videos which are videos of still images. Um, the video quality is so bad that actually it's, it's very beautiful because they look like they could be video images because if you see leaves, the leaves are all shimmering because of the, the bad quality of the, the, the screen but I actually think it's very, very beautiful. Um, so, you might see individual images there. If you see it in here, you'll see the larger series that they actually come from. 
Um, the art world in Italy is so utterly different to the art world in, in Australia, and I would say generally the art world in Europe. Um, Australia still sort of um, painting is this major art form in Australia um, that is no longer a major art form at all in, um, in Europe. Um, and especially in Italy, I would say, uh, where there's a much stronger conceptual framework to, to what people do. Um, and, um, and the kind of painting that there is, is much more of a conceptual kind of painting, not the kind of painterly painting that you get so much of in Australia. Um, I think that parts of that have to do with kind of, um, different people's relationship to the environment where they live. I think Australia is still, um, especially say white Australia, from what I can see, is still trying to understand actually where people live. Uh, I mean, 200 years when you're living in a country like Italy is nothing. There was um, an Australian, she's actually a New Zealand sculptress, who was doing a master's on Bernini when I was living in Milano. And she came to Italy, she was given a grant to come to Italy, so she wanted to go to, um, to Villa Borghese in Rome, where it's two or three of the best the mini sculptures are. She went there and it was closed for restoration. So she kept going back hoping it would open. Eventually, in desperation one day, she was bashing at the door. And this old lady and guardian opened the door. She tried to explain what she wanted that she was here. She only had a few months. The old lady looked at her and said, it was closed for five years. And goes, but I can't wait for five years. She said, five years is nothing. Come back in five years' time. <laughs> and, and if you think those sculptures have been there for 500 years, yeah. The old lady, from her point of view, was, was right, you know, but, you know, if you've got sort of a grant to do something on work, meaning you've got a different sort of agenda for that. Anyway, so there are different senses of time, and one of the things I sort of see in Australia, um, and the kind of art that I see here, it has um, a sort of, um, it's difficult to say, a kind of more condensed sense of time, much more immediate, and, um, and you know, again, these things are not better or worse, they're just different, you're just describing things as you see them. And I think all kind of cultural experiences, which mean basically where you're living, affects what you do and the way you do things. One of the things in a country like Italy, you've just, um, there's so much art history that's there, you've just got such a long tradition. And no one in the world today can compete with the, the great artists that we've had in the past for a very simple reason, is that um, so the famous artists like Michelangelo, Leonardo, any of them, existed in a world that had a total vision of itself, where you know, religion and everything fit together with a total world picture. We no longer have that. We live in a totally fragmented, a kind of atomized world. And so even if you are phenomenally good, you can only represent part of that atomized world. And um, so this is a, a kind of a problem for artists, but I think it also gives artists an enormous freedom for what they want to do. The, um, the thing with me, and um, you see in this work, is that um, increasingly, um, for many years I was traveling a lot. A lot of work I would do, having different exhibitions, was work where I'd travel like I come to Australia, in Japan, in the States, for a month. And so a lot of the work I was doing was inside, in sort of what you would call social situations. Then, six or seven years ago, I was already living in Tuscany, I moved to a very isolated house that is totally surrounded by woods, and it's very wild. Until about two years ago, we needed a four-wheel drive to get to the house. I mean, it's sort of, for an Australian, it's perfect. In fact, the house had been for sale for many, many years, and no one wanted to because it was just too isolated. For me, it was fine. Anyway, so in that period, my work has moved away, if you like, from sort of like what you call social situations or internal places in houses, or palaces and things like that, into nature. And you'll see this movement in the work that's here. Um, different things with my work have been, you know, different people have described it as kind of, over many years now in Italy, as kind of like near the rock. Um, Part of that, I think, actually comes from growing up in Australia, uh, in terms that, um, I mean, even if you live in the centre of the city, um, nature is there. And um, there are more birds from in the centre of Sydney than there are in Tuscany in, in the country. 
And so um, the idea of Baroque actually, we see it as an artificial sort of art form, but Baroque actually is of all that, the sort of art forms we ever had, the one that's closest connected to nature, because all the forms that you have in Baroque are forms based on um, and sort of curves and things that are going. I mean, you only have to look at some lovely little garden in there. And although you might perceive it as such, we have a nice little Baroque corner in East Sydney in there. It's just Baroque of its very nature. Um, sorry, you say Baroque in connection with nature, I think. Baroque, yes, yeah. 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 Okay, but anyway, Baroque in town. Very <laughs> of the work that I've done. Um, one of the things that I've always been interested in is what you would call um, intimacy. And um, if you look at these photos, for instance, all of the spaces are kind of intimate spaces. They're always kind of enclosed spaces, not wide, big open spaces, I guess. Um, and in that, the other thing is this tradition in art, which is called the pastoral, um, which is some sort of like Australian grazing land. It's where you have human beings in nature, which again is, um, is a human invention. I mean, human beings always lived in nature, and it's really interesting because if you see um, sort of early Italian painting, like the Quattrocento paintings, wherever you get nature, so it's sort of early, the pre-Renaissance paintings, wherever you get nature, it's kind of frightening. You have the wall city, anything happening outside is this dark wood that is terrifying because there were wolves, there were lions, um, all these animals that could kill you. And the only people you ever get in nature is someone like St. Saint, Saint Anthony, where there's often a picture of him taking the thorn out of the, the lions for things like this, San Francesco. And one of the things that we don't realize in Western people is how uh, fundamentally anti-nature Western culture is. There's one Western saint of nature, San Francesco, and there are hundreds of Muslim saints of nature. Um, and one of the reasons you know, with the Western development of scientific um, sort of thought, which has then sort of led into sort of industrialization and the whole kind of um, sort of ecological crisis that we have, is a Western phenomenon. I mean, we brought it to the world. Everyone else might be joining in, but it's our basically our baby. With that, so we start with an idea of nature as alienated in Western thought which goes back to Christianity, because nature represents the devil, um, the woman, nature, Eve, the tree, the apple, the serpent, and all of this. Adam presumably was there thinking about God sort of sitting under a tree looking at clouds. Um, anyway, with that, the first artist that we get that sort of starts this idea of what you call the pastoral is George Oren, and um, where's the beautiful painting of his of there's a naked woman, and there's a, a lutus clay, and she's bending over and, and taking um, some water in a picture. And the idea that human beings could live in harmony in a kind of natural world um, in this thing. And um, then from that you get to Tisha, then sort of it goes on um, to San. Then in the 19th century, so you get to well, you also the um, rococo painters like Fabinard or Doctor who deal with sort of these kind of idyllic situations. Often it's a kind of bacchanal situation where people enjoy themselves. A lot of it's very sensual or sexual and sort of orgies in, in the country, but where everything sort of fits together. Then in the 19th century, you get to Corot and Manet with his um, with Virginia Soleil, in which suddenly, this idea of human beings sitting in nature in a um, relaxed way becomes totally modern, where this woman suddenly is sort of terrifyingly naked and sort of totally out of place with these men that are sitting there talking about politics or philosophy or whatever. And um, so one of the things that for me, growing up in Australia, and what I was saying before, that one of the reasons why um, it's so, so profound in Australian art is nature. But the interesting thing in, that I perceive in Australian art, and my knowledge is very rudimentary, only what I see when I come, there is no real tradition of the pastoral in Australian art that you um, tend to get either nature or 
city item. And it's very rare that you get this kind of uh, things where one flows into the other. Um, part of that could be the prickly nature of Australian nature. It's not as if you want to sit naked, sort of where red ants are crawling around and things like that. Um, and the bush is a kind of, it's not, a, um, not embracing in the way that, say, European nature is embracing. Um, so there's that. Anyway, so in my work, it has been the scene of the pastoral, which sort of ends up in this series of, of people floating in water, um, which is the stream under the house where I live, um, and which is the, there's a, the more total series is this middle um, video screen that's here. Um, so these are sort of other qualities that I found that living in Europe, I've been able to develop them. Um, if I showed you the first work I did in Australia, it was already there. Um, I can look up on my iPad and if you want, you can scroll through my web page and look at it. It's a black and white work that was made into a book. Um, but it's sort of outside of the Australian tradition, something like that. And part of me that going to Italy, in a certain sense, I found something of myself that I wonder if I had lived in Australia, would I have ever known? And often I think. Um, that when you are a foreigner, and Australia is a country made up purely of foreigners, you know, it's, uh, that, um, that you often find things in yourself that you wouldn't have discovered where you come from. You know, I, you know, I don't know, but you know, I think of Conway, Sergei, so many of us that come from foreign backgrounds. You know, going somewhere else allows you to, to discover things and to bring out things that perhaps are there, but that you wouldn't necessarily come across. So, um, anyway, I think I could keep talking around and around forever. It would be more interesting if people want to say um, things or ask questions or say what they feel and what their situation is. What do you think about that observation about the Australian landscape? That generally, when there is a human interaction in the portraits of the Australian landscape, they're always men. Yeah. I mean, always men. Very few. Images of women in the bush rather than in a, um, mm. a uh, city sort of image would be um, Hildurix Nicholas's few you know, beautiful paintings and squatters yeah. and things like that. But still, it's interesting because she's still then cast in that male role, but at least it's a female presence yeah. in the landscape. But yeah, apart from we, we, one of the things Australian art is, is homoerotic. Art in Australia about 10 or 12 years ago, the initial one, eroticism in Australian art. The most erotic image of Australian art is the dead soldier in the Anzac Memorial um, in Hyde Park. Go and have a look at it. There's this dead man sort of lying over on a shield like that. It is staggeringly beautiful. It really is. And there are, apart from Bill Henson, and there are very few. Um, and, you know, I think his work is erotic, but there are very few images that sort of, what you would call central erotic of women in Australian society um, and Australian culture and the bush. And there's very few, I mean, Sydney Long has these kind of figures, but they're kind of um, asexual. Um, and Rupert Mully's figures are always in a, in a highly civilised part of that landscape, yeah. and it has been imported mm. from Europe, and it's like a little more you know, world unto itself, mm. rather than being part of it. But part of this is, couldn't be, um, because Australia was a, um, uh, a wilderness, so called, that becomes then colonised. And you get the same in the United States, mm. where you have the idea of the frontier. And in fact, um, in, I think it was 1960, um, a, an American literary um, expert wrote a book called um, Life and Death in the American Novel. And his thing was that American literature had always been homoerotic. It was always about men escaping together to get away from the women to go off to the wilderness. You know. <laughs> and he used <laughs> as a, and as a, and I, at the uh, it was really funny because his subtitle was "Hold the um, Hold the Rock, No Hold the Raft Huck Honey," which is from Uncle Barry Finn, where Jim, the, the Negro slave, keeps calling. Honey, you know, which was just the form of it. But again, this kind of classic idea of two men sort of escaping. Um, Europe just doesn't have that. And Europe is, and then again, where I live, uh, look at the difference between an Alfa Romeo and a Mercedes. 
Mercedes is masculine, now for a male is feminine. Italian is perhaps, or Italy is perhaps the most feminine culture in the world. And there are only two um, cultures that have basically the goddess as, as a major um, thing. One is India, and the other is Italy, and Roman Catholicism. Hmm? Yeah. yeah, well, but as a... Well, you have one, one photo mm. where the woman holds her breath. It looks like a Greek statue, you know, one of those vases. Ah, uh, yeah, well, it's sort of ancient Greek, but I meant as a living tradition. Yeah. It's true, but as a living tradition. And, like, obviously we have the Pope in Italy, uh, we have this sort of very uh, patriarchal structure, but on a, base, on a living level, it is, you know, Mary's the mother of God. I mean, Italians will tell you they're very simple. So, you know, um, and on where you travel around the country, you have all these little shrines everywhere. Only in the mountains in the north do they have Jesus. For the rest of Italy, it's always the, the Madonna or the female saint. And so on a practical level, and in India it's the same. I mean, uh, from a theological level, the, the goddess in India is not the most important you know, at all. Um, but it's the goddess Shiva, she is the manifestation which Shiva sort of is perceived in the world. So everything that you have in the physical world is, uh, is through her. And it's very interesting in Hindu temples because if you go into a Shiva temple, you have the Shiva Lingam. So the Shiva Lingam is basically a phallus that comes up and is surrounded by the yoni. The yoni is the vulva and this is the phallus. And the idea is that Shiva, when he makes love, can make love for 10,000 years. So there's a bit of friction and things can get very really hot. So one of the things you do in Shiva temples, people are always <coughs> pouring oil on milk. the lingam milk. To, and milk, milk to keep it sort of from getting too hot. Because if you get too hot, then you're going to have sort of the world's going to go up in smoke. Now the interesting thing with this, if this is the, 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 the penis here and this is the yoni around, where are we? We're inside the body of the goddess. Because where this is the ball and where the penis is, we're inside. You know? And so Indians, I mean, they're not thinking about it. An Indian going in and sort of putting oil on it is not thinking about that. But the, the, the underlying reality is that everything that you can see is female and of the goddess. And Italians have a very similar kind of approach to you know, the physical world and life. Australia cannot have that because of the nature of it's so big, because it's inhospitable. It's inhospitable. It's inhospitable. Yeah. It's And so these so, are... But it's, uh, doesn't it also come back and stem back from the, uh, the establishment of the country where only soldiers, um, you know, the military really stepped in, molded everything down, maybe a bridgeman or a tree, it didn't matter what was in the way. Hmm. And then very later on, civilization began. Yeah. And they had, and, and the women who actually were carted in, they had absolutely no rights, and they were treated like, you know, very machines, who yeah. created population, really. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I think if that is the foundation of Australia, there is no wonder why yeah. we have such a, a male, blocky country mm -hmm. where a, a woman just doesn't stand a chance, no matter what. More interestingly, the part that's true, and yet interestingly, there were women as as um, free women on the first and second, certainly the second fleet. There were women that, that were allowed, and families were allowed to come out as partners to people that were yeah. convicts on the second fleet. My and the is the second one, and they were here early on, and they were were like Elizabeth MacArthur. They were that <laughs> Elizabeth MacArthur. She built the wall industry not John MacArthur, it was her. So the women were actually here. So, but actually, actually backing up your story is that we never talk about that. Yeah. It's always yeah. being projected as an ass, even when, though when they're, they're given women. the respect. Yeah, it's worse, it's worse. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And I also, if you read early Australian pioneering history, particularly in Western Australia, you'll find mentions often of don't bring the missus out here. And, you know, and there's consternation amongst the people who are working on cattle stations and sheep stations that there might be a woman around, and that would upset the balance of you know, the order of things <laughs> and introduce discomfort into you know, a, a male society. Yeah. Yeah.
But can I ask you, what is a male society? What do you like to do by yourself? What, what is so interesting? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's actually the fear of the goddess. And I actually think that's very, 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 very deep seated. Very it's very actually the fear of the actual creative power of the woman yeah. that the man actually can't control, which is why the whole narrative of men is about exactly. control. And we never integrated the nature here. The nature here was the prison bars. So basically, it was just mm -hmm. people inhospitable, and, and you said it, you know, it's a barren, inhospitable landscape, because we were trying to live it at the Western values, yes, exactly. therefore it is inhospitable if we're trying to live that yeah. way. We never looked at it as a unique country with its own landscape that needed to be incorporated and the society needed to incorporate itself into it. We just used it as this sort of like that. That I realise, um, to the end of the show in Cologne, stopped in many pedestrian shopping street, walking up and down this you only had to walk 100 meters to where some of the galleries were, and there's no one. And I, I go around to galleries wherever I am, and I travel a lot. Generally, be it London, um, Sydney, Tokyo, I am the only person in any given gallery at any given time, which says a lot. The only place that's different to that is New York, in which generally there are a lot of people um, going to see after. Again, one of the reasons is. The galleries are all compressed in Chelsea, basically. Um, so there is a problem of, you know, it's not that, you know, just that people, maybe less people are buying now. There's a problem that we have a culture that's moving into a culture of spectacle. I mean, it's been moving for quite some time. What is spectacular gets a lot of um, news, and what isn't. And like this morning, I was in a cafe having breakfast and looking at Spectre Ooh, magazine. I wake up early from it. Uh, I couldn't wait till 11 o'clock. Anyway, so I, I'm looking at Spectrum, I open his John McConnell's review, and then I turn over, and you get a double page instead of a single page for cinema. Now, the Venice Vietnam... I'm sure there are six pages. Yeah, we've got all two, I can make them look beyond that. The thing is, art uh, is like that, but you can have the Venice Vietnam art, uh, okay, so for all of us involved in art, that's a major thing. Even the Italian newspapers, where after the opening, you might get one or two pages at maximum, full pages on the, the Biennale. When there's the, the, the Biennale for the cinema, every day there'll be six or seven pages just on that. Why? It's where the money is, basically. I mean, where money is, where advertising is, it goes. And art no longer has that, that money base. I don't think that's necessarily a, a bad thing. But it, it's, it's kind of problematic. It's problematic for the artists, it's problematic for the galleries. You know, Connie knows, and any, you know, galleries, how hard they work well, just to keep things. And like, for instance, um, one of the things with digital, the series of awards, the first series I've moved over entirely into digital, digital does have some good things. Digital is about flow. Um, digital is very different happy. I mean, all things digital. And actually, the, the title of the series is called Flow. What I found was that um, I could set the, the camera on the tripod, and basically, all of the uh, people in the series are me and my family. And, um, and I could kind of direct, you know, you can shoot 100, 200, 300 photos without having to take the film out of the camera, set it up, get the person out shivering in the water. And so you could do, because this water is underground water that flows into a pool. It is nice and cold even in the summer. The only person who enjoyed herself was her very frequent friend uh, who was in August. She was sort of like a fish in the water. Uh, there because um, she was fragrant you know, women around the park. Um, and um, so, uh, you know, so yeah, you get an image like that. There's all the sort of things behind it, like in the well, you could, but it's it means you just, you know, maybe it works, and then you only discover later on, you have to be good. Um, but also because I think, um, like, you know, we don't see it so much in this, but the earlier series of mine, or where you get single figures, like, um, there's one of me and Claudia in the walls, I just made a, um, is that um, my figures generally, I mean, what Connie said, I'm not, um, I mean, my work is very central, but it's not central. And generally, but, Central, there is a kind of sexual element. What is sexual generally is never the figure, it's the nature around it. 
and their nature could be the cloth that someone's holding um, the things. And so um, what is erotic is what has movement or action or life. And sort of, so um, generally, it's one of the reasons that, say, for instance, images of men are very difficult in our erotography because we have an idea that men should be dynamic, whereas a refined female is generally men and for women, sort of, sort of sexually, if you like, or sensual. And uh, so I think nature or the elements around that we have are not the rock. So, um, and so, so even this one of this um, Chinese girl lying on the rock, and she's got cobwebs on her hands and on her face. Um, and there's a slight movement in her. But what is really beautiful is the I find um, sure, she's lovely, but I like all the rocks around her. And I think it's that combination that sort of work the jagness of the rocks and the blue here. Yeah. 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 Like and she's very one. thin, you know, so she's got these bones in the jaw. But, I mean, things that leave a kind of counterpoint between them, and that counterpoint is what sort of makes the image or the paint or anything dynamic. Um, I remember reading a thing that there was an Australian artist called Mark Brown, so someone else. They got this grant of the visual arts books many years ago to travel around uh, stations in Northwest Australia, in the Northern Territory, to bring art. And they, they did a little catalogue which was a sum up, summing up of their experience. And they, their conclusion was it was a waste of time because these people didn't need it, you know, because they had such a direct rapport with nature that that was entirely satisfying. And, you know, I live in a very old house that is a new natural ideal. Tuscan farmhouse. It's really difficult to put art in old houses. You know, art in modern contemporary apartments, modern houses, everything square. It's really good. These houses were made before and without any concept of art. So the, the house is the artwork. And you can't put art inside art. And this is one of the problems with the, uh, the areas built out on the museum, is everyone goes to see the museum. And, you know, but that's really what everyone talks about. I mean, there might be something in the exhibition they like, but it kind of, it's art within art, so it's a kind of strange experience. Yeah, oh, yeah, you get a kind of double positive, which becomes a negative, if you like. So. But, but even then, in Florence, there are a few small galleries, there's a, an artist from the gallery, and there are a few others, um, that are kind of an exception, that's yeah. for sure. Anything in Rome? In Rome. That is conceptual, or big? Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Well, the thing is, Rome now, um, Rome for many years uh, had a very small, not very interesting um, art gallery of the scene, although many of the major Italian artists have come from Rome. And there's a few galleries that have been really important, like Sargentini had a gallery, um, where you may have seen the photos of Manus Manelis, it is um, one of many exhibitions. We just had all of these horses tied up for a month to sort of eat and ship in the gallery, and that was the gallery. Um, that was the exhibition. So these were things in the 1960s. So it was a very important gallery for conceptual and anthropological uh, things in mm -hmm. Rome. Um, but Rome now is the third most industrial city in, in um, Italy. And we we get industrials, we get the new rich people. And one of the big differences between Europe and Australia. In Australia, if you are rich, you might buy a yacht, you'll spend two or three hundred thousand dollars on a car, you'll do all of these things. But in Europe, if you're new rich, why don't you spend three hundred thousand dollars and try to get a car from the street? You know, this kind of thing. You don't do these things. And so people would tend to spend more money more readily on art. Um, and not necessarily for the cubans, it just is perceived as something to do. You know, and um, so one of the major galleries in the world is a gallery that is in San Gimignano, which is near where I live. So San Gimignano is this famous sort of tourist town in Tuscany that has all of these towers. Um, and three young guys started the gallery there, it's called Gallery Continua, um, about 20, just a bit over 20 years ago. There were three young guys, this is, um, so they had the energy of three young men. Generally, the gallery is one person, so you've got three times the gallery uh, the energy. Then, because it was in a country town, they had their whole family sort of support structure. So it started in a tiny 
you know, the first gallery would have been as big as you know, this area and that area there put together. And gradually got bigger and maybe they got sort of better. And there was a, an unused cinema um, in the town. They convinced and they set themselves up as a cultural institution, got the, the local council to rent the cinema and then turn that into this major gallery space where people like Ai Weiwei, the main climbing the there, Ainge Kippur, exhibit there. From that, they now have a gallery in Beijing, for the last six or seven years ago in Beijing. They have a gallery in Boulogne, uh, and uh, then just out of the Paris. Uh, uh, they do, now in San Giuliano, they don't do much selling. What they do is they do the, the art fair um, in Giro, and that's where all galleries now make money. And Connie will tell you, I mean, you go to a art fair, the gallery is an incredibly expensive thing. If the gallery comes out having covered its costs, um, it's doing really well. You know, because often the gallery will go away and come away sort of having spent three or thirty thousand dollars if they don't get back. You know. um, one of the problems that you get is moving to spectacles. So galleries like uh, so art is like Art Miami or Art Basel. Um, to give you an idea, I had a show in a gallery um, um, complex in Florida, and so I was in this gallery. The gallery next to me, the gallery that I was showing, went to the first art in Miami. In one weekend, they, what they spent is that they sold as much as they had sold the whole preceding year. They came back to close the gallery immediately. They thought, what's the point of coming to the gallery when we can do this just through art fairs? And there are a lot of galleries now survive on this thing, but it's a kind of big missing thing. When you spend a lot of money, you can make a lot of money. But you can't, you can't, that is something a lot of other galleries don't know, particularly the young galleries, just including in the Melbourne side of the room. You can't be a gallery that is not a gallery participating as a gallery in an art fair, yeah. because the, uh, um, the terms and conditions are that you run the gallery for at least a minimum of three to five years mm -hmm. before you apply and get accepted to participate in an art fair. And that gallery actually has to run also at least uh, for something like 35 hours a week. Yeah. Be open to that. But it means it has to be a professional business that runs every day. Mm. But you can still sit on the space, you have like an answering machine, whatever. And um, and so you can get in. The problem with that is, is that one of the Nothing problems anyway is, is, is that most of the money now in the country art is in these art fairs is that it's not good for an artist. I mean, the idea of you working for several years, do a body of work to have a show in which there's a kind of sense in that show, in the body of work. I mean, if you have a gallery, and if you've got these big gallery, they want a piece for this, they want a piece for that, they want a piece for that. And so you, you're doing work, basically, one piece to be shown in, another piece somewhere else, and it becomes a big problem. Another problem, and I've seen with lots of galleries, is that they are spending a lot of their time not back in the gallery, but traveling the world, doing these things, and as Connie knows, I mean, working at after it's, it's, it's like massive. You just work like a doll. You, it, it's just terrible. I mean, it's so difficult. And these people that are moving around all the time. And I think you can do it for a certain bit, but you lose the idea of the context. To be honest, as a, as a normal gallery, um, and I think I speak for the majority of most of the galleries, um, you have to do it yourself. And after you got to show up and then after you are being bugged, and now you have to put on the, the, the good dress and mingle with them all the internet and then show a nice face and get about to crash. So that's the, the reality of, uh, of this, you know, of, of the situation. I had the most crazy experiences to sell big pieces in the last hour of an art fair. Until then you have to hold it. You have, you have to have so much faith and such positive energy and such positive thoughts. You cannot lose faith in yourself and that you will sell and that's what's going on, is that someone will come and it's really power of the mind. It is, you can't be without the chance. It is, you've got to hold it up. People, very often, they just have no idea how galleries run, how artists live. This is an existence, this is an industry like any other existing industry. 
when people say, oh, you want this three thousand dollars? So when the artist gives it to me, and we then have to work together in faith that we say. Yeah, but people would like when I have this so many times, you know, someone wants to buy something and said, if I buy it, it will be worth the ten years ago. And so my answer to that is generally the German people would be buying something for four or five thousand dollars, you know, they're well off. So I said, what kind of car do you have on now? Well, the moment you put your signature on that contract to buy it, you'll count the value of that six or seven thousand dollars. But you didn't think twice of doing it, so why are you worried about this? You know? and, uh, and so people, I mean, they we have different ideas and concepts for everything. You know, once you, you know, and one of the big problems that you have is so many people, you know, they, they come and they sort of say, you know, will it be worth it? And I say, buy it because you like it, because it's not worth anything. You, you like it. I mean, you see so many, you know, so the big art is, is bought and sold as investment. You know, and, uh, you know, little things about the art world, for instance, why did Art Basel, you know, the Swiss, uh, the, these upright citizens of the world, why did they go to Miami? Why don't you do an art in Miami and not in New York or Los Angeles? No. Because the amount of dollars, basically, all of that South American money gets there very easily. Not yeah. I mean, the big art world, you know, this big price. Uh, so, I mean, what we perceive as art uh, and its prices and, and its values, uh, and you see this overseas much more than Australia, are a giant flux. You know, sort of state of prices and new prices are always totally different. I think what is the one thing to that statement is um, I think the problem is really the perception of value. Um, I think in Australia people are not used to, to buy art. They want a big painting of 155 by uh, one meter for two and a half thousand dollars. And that's what the perception is. And if I sell a small work for 1800 that is that, they think, no, I can get a bigger one. Yeah. So you see, it is a completely different set of values. I have to deal with people coming to my gallery. Art gets created out of the need of what the artist perceives from society in his life and makes that visible to the public, which is a huge thing because he turns the inside out to make it visible. And that always has something to do politically and socially with the climate of the country, wherever they are. for your incredibly participation and your comments and statements and questions etc. I think that it's incredibly valuable because the, the discussion and the conversation